You are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about positive solutions to environmental challenges. Solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics of earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned for Sustainable World Radio. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier. My guest today is Lonnie Grafman. Lonnie Grafman is an instructor of environmental resources engineering and appropriate technology at Humboldt State University. Lonnie is the founder of the Practivas Full Immersion Abroad Resilient Community Technology Program, the director of the awesome business competition for groups working on agriculture, water, and energy in Northern California, and the founder of the Apropedia Foundation. Lonnie has taught university courses in six countries and presented in dozens more. He has worked and led teams on hundreds of domestic and international projects across a broad spectrum of sustainability, from solar power to improved cook stoves, from micro hydropower to rainwater catchment. Lonnie's first book, To Catch the Rain, in both English and Spanish, covers inspiring stories of communities coming together to catch their own rain and shows how we can do it too. Welcome to Sustainable World Radio, Lonnie. It is great to have you here today. Thank you so much, Jill. I am very excited to be here. Oh, I'm so glad you're here. And I just have to tell listeners that after reading about your work, um, are you sure you're just one person? Because... <laughs> <laughs> you must travel or move at a speed much faster than the normal human. Because if I read your whole bio, it, I think it would take half the interview. Your work is so impressive. So what's your secret? <laughs> um, I really ahead, appreciate sorry. that question because the answer is no, I'm definitely more than one person, just like we all are. Uh um, not just because of all the different personalities we have, but also because every it, there is no great project that gets done by one person. So all the things I all the things I do are really just me as part of a, a, a brilliant, exciting, diverse team. Um, so so no, and thank goodness. <laughs> um, I, I I have the incredible luck of uh, of working with um, uh, incredible people making making just really fun, useful, needed stuff uh, um, in the world. Mm, That's so wonderful. And we're going to learn all about um, your work in this interview. And I'd love just to touch briefly on the beginning. And I'd love for listeners to get an idea of what originally inspired you to embark on your journey of doing good work all around the globe. Oh, wow. Um, That is, uh, I mean, how far back do you want me to go? Like childhood? Is that... When you were two, no, no, (laughs) no, as far, as far back as like what you were, you know, like maybe what was a catalyst or what, um, started you with wanting to, to help other people and help nature and kind of connect Mm -hmm. in that way. You know, I, I think I'd normally start this story, uh, when I was a teenager, homeless and just trying to make my own resources with the communities that I was in. Um, kind of starting the story in this very adversarial place where we just didn't have the resources we needed, uh, food, water, shelter, uh, energy. But, but the way you asked the question really reminded me, and maybe it's because I actually just had l- uh, brunch with my mom and we were talking a lot about her father, my grandfather, who had a lot of impact on me. Um, and he started my, my path towards activism. The story goes probably a little bit further back than him. We were in a bathroom in New York, I think. Um, I was young, I don't know, maybe seven. And he was a giant man, uh, uh, big cans, big, laid carpet his whole life, fought World War II and Korea. And he was definitely a man of his generation, you know, um, uh, loud and, and big and intimidating. And we're in there and he's drying his hands and he's just, he's getting so much paper towel just like five strokes on the paper towel and it's just like piling up and he, he's going to dry his hands. 
And, and I must have had a, a, a teacher, um, uh, I'm guessing maybe a kindergarten teacher because they're so impactful. I don't remember them, but I, but I, I looked at my grandpa and I was like, Grandpa, would you cut down a tree just to dry your hands? And, uh, you know, I'm sure those words came to me in, in, in a class and our, our school teachers are just so I- important. But he he didn't do that typical kids should be like seen but not heard. He just looked at me. He didn't respond. But he took the last bit of the paper towel and just tore off a bit. And he used that to dry his hands. And in, in all the years after that, until his way too early death, um, uh, every time we were in a bathroom together, he would make a point of only going like a half stroke with the paper towel and never said a word. We never talked about it, but he would do that. And I think it really impressed upon me how much impact, no matter how much power we have, like by society, no matter how much legitimate power we have, we have a lot of power to impact the people around us to, to, to help protect nature. Oh, that's so that's so empowering um, for children to learn that they can speak out and that some adults will change their behavior. So I could see how that would really empower you as far as um, the environment goes as a child. And it really shows the impact that teachers can have on our lives and on children and the adults they live with. Yeah, I wish I could remember what teacher told me. Like, I, w- I wish I could send a letter, you know, which is, uh, and when I, when I work, I, I've told this story before because I, 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 through my university work and, and, and some of my other work, I get to work with K-12 teachers uh, helping to bring sustainability as context for their education. Um, so when they're teaching kids math, instead of teaching a parabola as a formula, they can teach it first as how you would toast a marshmallow with the sun. Mm. Um, and it's a really fun process and I love working with them and, and, and it, you know, I, I remind them like, I'll never remember this teacher's name, but I, I'm positive that there was one that taught me to be an activist. Right. Um, and, uh, it wasn't like I, I had other influences on environmental stewardship, but I'm pretty sure that the language and the fact that I said that to my grandpa came, came out of that. I love that. And really, I've worked with as an environmental educator with for ki- with children for years and years. And I remember that feeling like we'd see so many throughout the year. And then I remember kids like, Jill, do you remember me uh... yelling across the parking lot? And one little one little boy held up a clean canteen, like a metal reusable water bottle. And he goes, I had my whole family switch. Oh, my gosh. I love it. <laughs> no more plastic. I love it. Yeah. I think Bill Mollison, um, co-founder of Permaculture, said that if you ever want to get anything done, get a group of women and children. No offense, Lonnie. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> Maybe I, I shouldn't have said that in the interview, but kids. No, no, yeah, really. no. I mean, it's it's definitely, I, if if you look at the groups I, I work in um, and you look at the percentages, like it's almost always, there's almost always a lot of powerful women and children in it. Um, and most of the projects, a lot of the projects that we'll probably end up talking about now, um, the the visionary or the main director often is a is is a powerful woman. In fact, the one I just mentioned, where we're bringing K twelve teachers, that's this program called Design Your Future, and uh, Professor Beth Eschenbach is the director. I'm the I'm the sub director. I mean, it's called co director, but I'm really the sub director. <laughs> Well, so we don't do like I I probably scared you in the email I sent you this morning, a five hour podcast. (laughs) Um, Let's dive. Let's dive into um, your practivism work. So I love the word that you use for your work. And I also think it's a program that you run out of Humboldt State University. But what is a practivist and how can we become one? Ooh, I love that question. Well, so, you know, we, we just talked a little bit about my path towards activism uh, through work, you know, the first thing I said to my grandpa. Um, and I tried out uh, classic activism because I was really unhappy with the conditions of the world. I just, I didn't, I think like most children, I didn't understand how there could be such grave inequities between the qualities of life and how some people could have almost nothing and some people could have more than they could ever possibly use, right? And I, and I think it's something that's easier to get used to as an adult, but when you look at it with kids' eyes, you're like, this just doesn't make any sense. Um, and so, you know, I, I approached activism from a pretty angry position of wanting to fight against that. And I did that for a couple of years, um, and it was pretty destru- I got pretty destructive with it. I think I just wanted to tear down the existing systems um, and then start over. 
But there ended up being a lot of innocent bystanders, and I didn't change many people's minds. It was kind of cathartic, you know, destroying. (laughs) (laughs) Um, uh, And then also, I'm not great at telling people what not to do. Instead, I started working towards just building the alternative. So, so I'd work with activists, and they would say things like, "Hey, you know, stop w- burning oil; it's destroying the world." And then I would be like, "Great, th- keep pushing on that. I'm gonna start building these alternatives." So, so here, let's build solar, and uh, let's let's build educational programs around energy efficiency, so that they're. You know, some people are saying don't do this and other people are saying do this and then together we can create this future. And so flash forward, uh, I've now run programs, brought a group of students to El Salvador and then we're in northern Mexico and we're in southern Mexico and we're doing this work where we're just building alternatives with community members. Uh, Things like solar power, solar pasteurization, farms, permaculture, uh, waste materials into, into products. And you know, reporters and other people would ask our name. They're like, you know, oh, what, what's your group called? And I'm like, we're just people. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, the reporters would be like, uh, y- you have to have a name. I'm like, no, we don't. You know, I thought I, <laughs> I thought I was like so revolutionary, you know, like we're just the people. We don't have shirts like anyone. Anyone who wants to work is is welcome. Um, but ev- <laughs> but I, they were right. And I was wrong. People do need a name so that they can write. <laughs> they can like find you later. Um, and uh, so I'm in southern Mexico working with a group called Otros Mundos uh, and with the hope to work together in Sotso communities in, in Chiapas. Uh, one of the directors, Tanya, Tanya is uh, um, talking with me and she's explaining their work and they do a lot of activism. And so I'm trying to explain how we don't do activism for a couple reasons. One, for all the things I just said, but also because it's illegal for foreigners to engage in, act- in, in direct activism in, in Mexico. And if there's a legal scholar that is, wants to tell me I'm wrong, please, I might be wrong. This is my understanding that, you know, I have no, I'm not good at law and politics. My understanding is it's, it's actually illegal to engage in, uh, in protests if, if you're a foreigner. And so I'm trying to describe to her what we do. And finally, she stops me and she says, oh, you're not an activist. You're a practivist. Ah. And the name just stuck. And all of a sudden, we had a name for our group. And it's a loose name. Anyone can use it. We don't hold any IP over the, any intellectual property over the, over the name. <laughs> um, but, uh, but now we've had Practivistas Mexico. We've had Practivistas Dominican Republic. We've had Practivistas India, where the idea is that instead of telling people what not to do, You work together to create alternatives that are better. That's so powerful because I think what happens is if you're constantly telling people what not to do, as I was in my early 20s, I think you just become this voice of doom and that no one wants to be around you. (laughs) No, So that was that was definitely happening to me. Right. Like I was so angry and I still am. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And we need protest. And we're not saying no protest. I think activism and protest, especially at this point in history, is so important. It is is critical. And I work with a lot of groups that do direct engagement. And I'm often working on, okay, how do you stay safe? How do you build signage? What, you know, what, what, what equipment, what infrastructure do you need to, to be effective? Um, But, but absolutely, we, we need and we've always needed people showing their anger, right? Because, because there's very good reasons to be angry, right? Um, uh, showing their anger and sharing it so that we know what we need to rebuild. Mm-hmm. It's so true. And, you know, I love the idea that's in your book to catch the rain. And we'll talk about that in uh, a bit. But I love the idea of point positive design, which I'd never heard of. And you talk about the importance of that. And I think you said it's from kayaking. Can you, and I think that's what you're saying is instead of just railing against what is, you bring in the alternative. Yeah, so my motorcycle is uh, breaking down today. So I'm, I'm, I'm probably gonna go with the motorcycle analogy when you're, <laughs> cause it's on my mind. Uh, <laughs> when you're riding motorcycle um, and for your listeners who, who, who ride, uh, they all know if there's an obstacle in the road you do not focus on the obstacle. You notice the obstacle, you make, you make a mental note of the obstacle, but then you look at the path. You look at where you want to go. Because when you ride, if you, look at, if you focus on the obstacle, you're gonna hit the obstacle. 
And the idea, the word comes from kayaking, is the lead kayaker, and I am not a good kayaker. I'm much better motorcyclist than I am a, a, a kayaker. So you can ask me motorcycle questions, but we're about to hit the edge of my, my <laughs> kayaking knowledge. But when, when you're kayaking, the lead kayaker, uh, when they see an obstacle, when they see a danger, they don't point at it. They point at a path around it because that's the where you want people to go. And so the idea of point positive is to design in a way that helps people go in the desired path. I love that. That's so, I mean, that is such a, I really want to think about that because I can see how that would apply to so many different aspects of life. It, it really, you know, uh, we were, we started out this show talking about, uh, grade school, kindergarten teachers. And I think that, I think that kindergarten teachers and child development people, they've known this for years. And I, I think that the word in their field might be called a uh, strength-based approach, uh, but, but I, I also may be wrong. You, maybe you, you, you know the word, but, but I think that all kindergarten teachers I've ever talked to about point positive, they're like, oh, that's absolutely what we have to do. If you just say, don't do this, it's probably what they're gonna do. But if instead you're like, with, you know, let's say that I, uh, that they're hitting a table over and over again, right? And you're trying to, you want them to stop. Instead, if you're like, would you like to do this or this or this? And you provide three excellent options, you're going to get a much better result. And I don't mean to say that we should treat all of our, we should treat each other like children. But, but I do think that there's something that we can learn from that edge case of, of, of how just we work as humans. Mm -hmm. I love it. And I love that idea, too, of just pointing out a different way to go, mm -hmm. which I think we need right now, desperately. I do, um, I, I do too. <laughs> so your projects, Lonnie, are varied and worldwide. And it seems like there you've been all over um, providing solutions for communities. And I think the theme running through them is the importance of community utilizing community knowledge and empowering the community toward greater resilience. Mm. So why is community a key element, if not the key element, in creating and implementing your lasting um, design solutions? Wow. Well, uh, um, so another beautiful question. And there's a couple of interesting words I'd like to come back to in that question, but first let me answer it. Um, and, and the reason why is that uh, technology is easy. And, and I say this I say this as a technologist, as somebody who, you know, uh, every day I am uh, frustrated and festering on hardware or software or the built environment. That said, that stuff is easy compared to community. Mm -hmm. And and if you give me an option between having a functioning community and a functioning technology, I'll always pick the functioning community because they can build the technology. And you can't go the other way. In addition, uh, the only reason for technology is, is to help support community. I mean, otherwise, why even have it? Um, so for me, it, it, it's about community. And a lot of it comes down to a, a, a practical thing, which is if we want to build solutions, um, then we have to figure out how to work together because we won't even know what to build if we don't. And then even if it was built and even if it happened to be the right thing, we wouldn't know how to maintain it if we didn't know how to do community. And then do you mind if I come back to a nuance in the wording? Oh, no, not at so all. So there's this, the, uh, I just wanna be clear that I don't provide solutions. I don't come in with, with answers. Uh, what I come in with is uh, a desire to deeply engage with community to figure out what the needs are, what the resources are, what the abilities are, and what we should build together. And, and it's always a surprise to me. I mean, I come in with an idea of what I think people are going to want and what I think people are going to need, and I'm I'm always somewhat wrong or totally wrong. Um, uh, so there, there's a, a nuance there, and I, I appreciate you letting me explore it, but to me, it's an important one. I don't know the answer. I don't have the solutions, and I don't think that that I ever will for, for any deeply exciting, diverse uh, uh, problem. It has to come from the answer has to come from a collaboration. Mm -hmm. And that makes total sense. And I would think a key component of that then is listening. Mm. Yeah, that's my, that's my, that's my keyword. It might have to be my keyword because I, I like, 
I, I talk a lot, right? So, um, so I often have to repeat that to myself, but I think it's, you know, it's the most valuable tool for an engineer to develop. And, and, and I often consider your job to be the first job of an engineer. Like first you have to be a journalist. You need to be able to ask questions that evoke answers that surprise you. And you have to be able to then hear those, incorporate them, and then make a new question based upon your deep, your deep understanding and lens on that answer. Some communities, it's really easy for me. Uh, some communities, it can take months or years to develop the trust to even have something to, uh, uh, to directly listen to. And there are a couple other tools that are really similar. Um, another one is to observe. So just really watching what's happening in the world around you, um, uh, whether it's just watching things that are related to what you're working on or something that is actually it. So like if you want to know um, about rainwater and water, you just watch people use their water. Like how do, where do they get their water from? How do they, how do they think about their water? How, like, uh, which might be hard to see, but then maybe you'll ask about it. Um, how, often do, how often do they get water? What do they do with their water when, when they're done? But maybe, maybe you've already, maybe there's a rainwater catchment system. That's what you're interested in building. Well, you have to watch people use it and really see it, not through your lens of like, oh my God, rainwater is the best thing ever, but through their lens as a, as a user. Mm -hmm. That makes total sense. I could see that. And I really loved what you said too, about how your students in the practice Practivistas program don't go in like with the answer, but they go in as co-conspirators. Mm -hmm. So I could see how observation would be really key in that. It really is. Because you're meeting meeting the community where it is. For sure. And that, you know, the amount that you have to do that uh, has a lot to do with how far from your own culture you are. Right? Um, and I really think that um, that there should be training for, for tourists, right? Like, you know, your, your job is to just see. Um, and, and I'm not sure why this interview keeps coming back to like child development, <laughs> but, but you know, uh, it, it, in child development, you really, it, you need to first see like how a family is working, like, and why it works and what, like, like what all the pieces are that makes that action work that might not seem to make sense to you. And it's the same with culture. There's all these things that are happening that are all tied together and it takes a long time to start understanding them. But, but it's a really enjoyable and beautiful process to see why do people do things this way instead of just trying to tell people what to change. Now, the advantage of working in your own community, your own neighborhood, is that you can jump much quicker to just trying to, trying to just change the system and be like, okay, I now know why um, we uh, leave our lights on, right? And now I am going to help people turn off their lights, right? Like, um, I know why people, like, we waste a lot of money at the, sh at the shower, leaving the water on until it gets hot. We walk away, right? So you can engage with that from a technology point of view. You can engage, engage with, with a policy point of view by pricing. You can engage with it at an education point of view. You know, there's so many ways to do it. And if it's your own community, you can just jump in a lot faster. Hmm. And we all have a skill set oh, yes. to offer. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's, there is, not only is there room for everybody in, in this movement that, that, that I'm guessing all of your listeners, or the vast majority of your listens, listeners are already a part of, but this, this movement to, to really try to um, Im improve the lives of everyone. Um, uh, not only is there room for everyone on that movement, but it, it, there's a need an incredible need for the most diverse set of skills because the problems are myriad. It's so true. And that's really hopeful. And that, I think, especially at this time of upheaval and change, um, that is something to inspire hope is I have a place at the table and something to give. You, so much. You talking to, to your listeners, you are absolutely needed and desired and and what the perspectives that you have to bring are necessary to be able to get to the next level. Lonnie, did you start your work um, knowing that community involvement was crucial and observation and listening, or was this something you learned along the way? <laughs> uh, you know, I think community, maybe. I'm not sure. I might have to come back to that. 
But I know for sure that I did not start knowing that listening and observation were critical. Um, uh, I know because I painfully learned the lesson many times, professionally <laughs> and, and, and in my own advocacy work. I came in, I kind of came at it from a punk rock, which I still love, um, young, self-righteous point of view. Uh, I ostracized all the minds that I tried to change. None of it worked. Uh, and part of the reason none of it worked was that my approach was not inclusive. It was very much like this, that is wrong, this is right, you must do this. Um, now, I still hold a lot of those same, a lot of very similar stances, like on what I think, you know, uh, the, the major steps we need to be doing. Um, and how we need to start uh, um, building in more equitability and mutual respect and understanding. Uh, but to do that, I recognize that I need to model that, not just as a good model, but also because I don't know the answers. How naive is it to think that I that that I knew the answers? That that's probably the most like teenage thing that I had going. Like it was a I was, you know, I was already, I was running my own life, so I didn't have that teenager part, but I really had that self-righteous thinking I knew the answers. And once you know that you don't, a really, a, a really great follow-up <laughs> is, oh, it, we need to be collaborating, right? And we need to be listening to each other. And the benefits of that are, are multifold. One, I've been able to change a lot more minds. Two, one of the minds I've been able to change is my own. Uh, which is incredibly powerful. And I, I wouldn't have gotten there if I wasn't able to, to listen and, and, and also to observe the, the, um, the metrics of the projects and be like, oh, well, this part, this part didn't work out well. Why not? Um, and then three, and, and this one might be the practically most important one, is that by listening to each other, we can evolve much stronger solutions more resilient, more regenerative, more round because they've represented more points of view. Uh, and, um, you know, this is probably a, with a lot of my activist friends right now. I think that it's a point of contention between us, like how much listening really needs to be done when you're faced with such atrocities. Um, and I think that I'm speaking from a position of privilege to say, to, to come at this and say, oh, I think that listening is always important. And there's a really good chance that I'm wrong, that some situations are just too drastic and too obvious and there's just too much bullshit Beep. that maybe you don't need to listen. But that's, but for me, I'm gonna keep trying to listen. You know, I think as well that the more that we, at least in my case, the more I feel like I know nothing, mm. it's so liberating. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, I am much less hard on myself now than I was before. Mm -hmm. Now that I know, I don't, <laughs> you know, now that I know that I don't know the answer, it's a lot easier to be like, oh, yep, that, that did, that did not go as I expected. <laughs> I know, I knew, I don't know what happened. I knew everything in my 20s. Oh, yeah. It's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, what, ha but I do, I mean, yeah, I have people who I haven't seen in years you know, like maybe, I mean, pre-COVID, mm -hmm. right? Where I had some people from college or something and like I'd go to their house and they would be like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. The toilet paper isn't organic. Oh God. <laughs> I was like, I was so judgmental. Oh, oh that's geez. so funny when you can feel their fear, you know, and that, yes. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, luckily I very, I do really embrace the one, the hypocritical, the hypocritical nature of, of just being human. But also, mm -hmm. I mean, we live in the U.S., or I live in the U.S., right? Me too. Just by living here, I have way more impact than most of my colleagues. Right? No matter no matter how environmental I try to be, right? So like the I, uh, it has been a long time since I've ever judged somebody else's lack of environmental personal action um, because mine is so atrocious. <laughs> exactly. It's so true. And it is liberating, right? And it does open up to where solutions and teachers are everywhere. Right. And I think that approach is wonderful. And, you know, reading about your pro some of your projects, I would think that many NGOs and other organizations could learn a lot from this approach. 
um, especially community skills, um, community knowledge and appropriate technology and available materials, I thought on site, you know, or in that area. Because so often we do see organizations um, just applying cookie cutter aid kind of on communities. So I really like this other approach, inclusive. I, I appreciate that. And it has been uh, uh, a painful, long ride that that it's still that this still seems to be fringe and i am i'm not even close to being a pioneer on this type of thinking right like like the fact that that i've been doing it for over 20 years and that i was not even close to being a pioneer and that we're still facing these same issues where giant organizations come in with cookie cutter solutions that end up destroying community uh, bringing in things that put local businesses out of business because their donations out overwhelm them. The fact that we're still doing that is just is just so sad. You know, this year uh, or in the within the last year, we lost one of the pioneers on this type of thinking, which was Paul Pollock. Um, he has some fantastic books, including uh, um, uh, "Out of Poverty," uh, is, is a great one. He's interviewed. I think he interviewed somewhere between three and 5,000 poor farmers over his life. Wow. Uh, um, and these are interviews. These aren't like, you know, like here's a questionnaire, fill out on a scale of one to five, right? These are deep questions. Tell me about your life. Right? Tell, me, tell me what's working for you. What isn't working for you? Tell me if you had $100, what would you do with that $100, you know? Um, and uh, I really suggest if you're if you're into that type of thinking to check out his work. And there's there's so many more people working on these forefronts. That's so exciting that there are many people doing this work. I feel like um, the type of work that you're doing and other people, I feel like this type of work has the potential to generate real change and to bring about more equality, which we so sorely need in the world right now. And I, I would also um think that it would be very refreshing for the communities that you're working with as well too right and that's something that I wanted to ask you and I kind of alluded to it um, earlier if we find ourselves in a position where we can help others either monetarily or with action and collaboration can you give us just maybe two or three tips on how we can do so sensitively and respectfully wow yeah uh, we did talk about listening and observing um, uh, and of course that that's critical. Um, uh, maybe we talked a little bit about trust, but I'd like to talk about that more, which is, which is building trust, um, uh, is, is really critical success. And, uh, and that comes differently in different communities. It comes at different speeds, but a lot of it starts with, with your openness to understanding that, that none of us have the answer on how to live. And if you're coming from a rich country and think you know how to help a poor country, you're probably wrong, right? Mm -hmm. There's things that work in rich countries that only work because we can keep throwing money at the solution. Um, there's things in rich countries that don't work at all. I mean, my classic example, when I'm dealing with uh, someone from the US who thinks they have the solutions in another country, the first thing I say is, go visit a whole bunch of senior homes and tell me we have the solution. And I'm in no way ba I'm no way lambasting senior homes. And I'm in no way lambasting people who have who who have put the older people in their life in a senior home. I 100% understand it. It's because we've built our society in such a way that you kind of have to. But like that can't be the it, the solution can't be just to put our old people away. And 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 also I want to recognize that a lot of a lot of your listeners who have uh, older people in their life in senior homes might have them in beautiful senior homes because they're the ones listening to this show, right? And they might have them in ones where there's a lot of community engagement and there's things for their older people to do to to uh, for them to do and ways to engage. But I visited a lot of senior homes where where there's there's no there's nothing left for these people to do, mm -hmm. and yet I work in other communities where the old people have roles, and. And I don't want to talk much about this because I have no expertise, right? And and also I hope I haven't uh, offended anybody or or that you've stopped listening to my point because because of this. But my point, the main point I want to mention is, there are probably a few thousand 
things you could look at that if you looked at closely in a rich country, you'd recognize that we don't have the solution. Let me pick one that'll resonate with your listeners more. Uh, and hopefully your listeners can ignore everything that I just said if it, if it offended them. Um, so, so here's one more for your listeners. If you think you have the solution and you come from a rich country, recognize that probably you're having four to 10 times more negative impacts on the environment than whatever community you're trying to help fix. Um, rich people, just by the nature of their consumption, have way more impact than poor people. The difference is, is that rich countries, rich communities, rich neighborhoods, and rich households can hide that, right? We have dumps that are, that are away. We have wastewater that's away. We have energy production that's away. So you come to a community and you see a generator running and you see waste in the street and you're like, oh my gosh, look at all this environmental impact. There's probably much more in your rich community. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so true. It's the hidden, it's the um, hidden side of convenience. A absolutely. And, um, and so once you recognize all those things, I think it becomes a lot easier to provide uh, assistance. If you're providing assistance of your time, then spend a lot of time just listening and observing and, and recognizing how lucky you are to get to see how other people live. Um, if you're giving your money, my, my suggestion is uh, um, to find transparent, small groups that have the stakeholders that you're trying to help, that they have those stakeholders in, in positions of decision-making and power. And I'm not, I'm not saying be puritanical about it. Like it could be a mixed group, but like, you know, some. That's good advice. I like that. I'd love to chat with you now about Appropedia, but before we move on, is there anything else you want to add about your community work or your projects working with community? Hmm. No, I think, I think I'm good. Thank you. Appreciate that. So Lonnie, you're the president of Appropedia, and can you tell our listeners about this website? I think you have like over 75 million views worldwide and 350,000 edits. So if we are going to the site, what might we find there? So it, Appropedia is a spot for community-made solutions uh, um, around climate change, poverty reduction, environmentalism, uh, and it's the largest site of its type and it's really for nitty gritty information. So if your listeners wanted to build a rainwater catchment system or a gray water system uh, or swales or hugelkultur or, you know, just any, like you could pick a letter and I can pick a technology that they could look up. Um, this is a site where people can come and find the, the details on how other people did it, including their failures. So the focus is on not just pretty thick pictures, but really on the, the, the nitty gritty of how to do it, how much it's gonna cost. Uh, we have tens of thousands of projects. And like you said, I think we recently just, I think we actually just passed 400,000 edits. So that wow. means that you know, people all around the world have taken the time to add their, add their content or, or make changes. And, you know, and some of those edits are just grammar. Like, like if you're on the site and you see the wrong there, and you want to correct it, you can just click edit and correct it. It's a wiki. That's so cool. Um, but then other of those edits are are the only place, you know, um, that you're gonna find how to build. Well, before COVID, it was the only it was the only good place you're gonna find how to build an open source uh, um, ventilator, right? Or um, you know, a great site to find how to build hand washing stations or face masks. Uh, and it, it it's funny because it's not funny. It's not funny at all. It's frustrating, but interesting uh, that we finally have got, I, we've been running this, this site and this organization for about 16 years. And this year we've raised more money than we raised in all 16 years previous. Hmm, interesting. And we need more. So, you know, if, if you're looking for a place to donate, Appropedia Foundation. Well, it sounds like so many people are involved. That's really exciting. It, it is, but one of the reasons we're finally getting money, and this is the part that's, that, mm -hmm. that's frustrating, is that a lot of rich people don't know that we're all one foot away from being poor people. And by rich and poor, I mean financially. Right? Um, but we really saw this in, in, uh, with, our, with COVID and shelter in place, that all of a sudden, efficient delivery systems, while they're beautiful and elegant, they don't protect us 
from perturbances in the system. They don't protect us from the inevitable natural disasters that we're going to have and pandemics that we're going to have in the future. I mean, this was not, you know, people talk about this as a black swan event, but in my, in, in my field, everyone knew that a pandemic was going to hit someday. And, and once those things happen, efficient delivery, efficient supply chains are, are not enough. You need resilience and you need community. And so by building in redundancy, by building in community capacity, where you have, where you have your power and your water and your manufacturing all distributed, you, you build back in that resilience. And I think that that's why we're finally receiving the, the funding that we were looking for. I mean, we had technologies that became necessary that be, for, for rich countries that before were only necessary for poor countries. I know. I really feel like the frailty and the interconnectedness of our system. It's almost like the Wizard of Oz where the curtain was oh, yeah. <laughs> was pulled off. And so, you know, people are really with health care, lack of health care, the racial injustice that's really coming to a head. Thank God. Yes. Right. Um, it's just been so many changes and so many disturbances to the system. Right. And so how can we say listeners are listening right now and say, I can relate to this. How can I um, create more resiliency in my community? I, I love that question. And I really like to take a practical uh, sidestep to talk about how, why this question is so Im important, right? It's important mm -hmm. for our survival. This, this will not be the worst thing. And, and I'm knocking on wood and I hope I'm wrong, right? But this isn't going to be the, this isn't going to be the worst disaster that hits your community. Um, so use this, uh, to, to n not just be, a trial, but a, a, you know, a warning call and a trial. Um, uh, and then before I answer your question, I also want to talk about, like you mentioned racial injustice. Racial injustice is wrong because it's wrong, right? But I also want to hit the practical, which is if the more you do to make sure that your society is working for everyone, the more you're making sure society is going to work for you when a disaster hits. Wise words. Okay. <laughs> I mean, there's there's things that are right just because they're right. But also, there's this very practical element, which is which is make sure that the more justice you have, the more you're actually protecting yourself from future perturbances. Because, because when a natural disaster hits, those tools that you built to make sure that the people that have the least no longer have that little, no longer have nothing. You know, the more that they, the more that they have, the more we all have. Um, uh, okay. So then your question, how do you build resilience? Um, the first thing is, is uh, make sure that you're building it in yourself. And the easiest way to do that is to find what things resonate with you and realize that there's, that there is a use for that in the movement. Um, if you are uh, an artist, there is so much room for you to be an artist in the movement. If you're great at childcare, holy crap, is there room for you in the movement? You, you running a kid's corner during the meeting has all of a sudden made this movement so much stronger and so much more diverse and so much more resilient and so much more inclusive. And possible. And, po and, and yeah, and possible. And so the first thing is figure out what, what you like giving because we want you in the movement forever because wisdom is critical, right? So you being in the movement full force for two years and then dropping out, right? Like, like maybe you didn't realize, maybe, maybe, maybe you're one of the listeners who like, you know, didn't realize that we needed to be focusing, especially if you're in the U.S., on, on, on race issues or on police issues, right? Well, I understand how how high that fire burns once you realize how much injustice there is. But we also want you to be part of this movement for your entire life. So find something that works for you, something you enjoy giving. And then my next suggestion is find people that are already doing it and bolster that movement. If you find yourself wanting to create something new, the first question you should ask yourself is why? Is this about ego? Because if it is, uh, we do need to feed your ego, but find other ways to do it, right? Like we all have, we have to fuel all these parts of ourselves. You know, we have to eat food. We have to feel good about ourselves, all these things. But, but try to do that inside of an existing movement. The easiest way to build a movement is, is to be the second follow. You know, it's to fan, it's to fan the flames.
instead of start the flame. Um, I can give more. I mean, that's that that would be the first. Those are great. That's great. Is there any other anything else you want to mention? Um. Yeah. Uh, learn to be comfortable being uncomfortable. If your movement feels completely comfortable to you, it's probably not inclusive. Um, learning how to 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 revel. In that discomfort, you know, I, I say this thing to my students, which is at the gym, pain is weakness leaving the body. In school, frustration is ignorance leaving the mind. And in the world, discomfort is privilege leaving perspective. Oh my at, gosh, I'm going to write that down <laughs> and put it over my desk. Um, but, but also... Just like at the gym, you don't want to stay in constant discomfort, right? Growth happens in discomfort, but you also need to have a safe space for yourself, you know, a space where you're not uncomfortable so that you can, so that you can regenerate. And so I, I really encourage people to move in and out of, the, uh, of those spaces and those feelings. And that goes back to your self-resilience, because if you're just burning out, not comfortable constantly, you can't, it, it's not, there's no longevity in that. Absolutely. And then also, you know, a, as a listener, like I, I'm not like I've only been doing this for for 25, 30 years. Right. I There's a really good chance that all of this advice is, is wrong. And so it, it like and, and feel free to send me an email with why it's wrong, because I'm, I'm, I am always looking like maybe what we do need is for everyone to just burn fast. And it's OK that they're burning out because then we'll have new flames. And and and. The good news is, is that there is no one approach that is going to fix all our problems. So there's plenty of room for other approaches. This is just the advice from, from my perspective. Um, but, and then finally, I understand that, you know, it's a lot of privilege to say, find where you fit and, because we want you in for 30 years. Because there's a lot of people that can't wait 30 years because they may die. Not not because of not because of their age, but because of the environment that they're trying to change. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, so you know, there's a lot of privilege when I say it. That, uh, but I struggled at picking it, and I and I and I picked this approach because I was burning out, and I've watched so many people leave the movement because it just hurt too much. Well, this really became a lot about activism, Jill. <laughs> yes, it really, it did. And I feel like as someone who did experience some burnout with environmental and activism work, um, the discussion we're having, your words are just falling on me. And it's like, oh, this is great. It's what I needed to hear. That, that, that's beautiful. I do feel like it's important to have self-care, take care of ourselves, take care of others, and take care of the planet. For sure. I, I agree. And I think if you start, if you go in that order, if you take care of yourself, others, and then the earth, that that order really provides the resilience that gets you the most for all three. Yes, it's those permaculture ethics, earth care, people care, fair share, just in a different order. Um, so Lonnie, we're getting close to the end of our time and we, I really wanna be sure that we have um, time to talk about your book, To Catch the Rain. It's available in English and Spanish, and people can find it at tocatchtherain.org. And um, I think it's targeted to makers and DIYers and anyone who's interested in rainwater catchment. And Bill Mollison, um, one of my heroes, is the co-founder of Permaculture. He said, if you only do one thing, collect rainwater. Can you tell us why this is so important? And maybe just share one project that you've done, or one or two, um, with rainwater catchment. Thanks. It, that is such a great quote. And, and I struggled deciding which book I wanted to write first. There, there's 15 books in this series that I want to write, mm -hmm. five trilogies um, around different resources. The, and, and when I was trying to pick, it, it was a struggle. And then um, Survivalist really helped me figure out which one I should do first. Right? And Survivalist have this rule of three uh, law, which is uh, you can live three weeks without food, but you can only go three days without water. Uh, and I was like, oh yeah, water. <laughs> um, also, you know, water is like, it, it's kind of crazy to think about 
how little water there is on the planet, right? Like, like I, I don't, uh, um, I was just, I just did uh, an interview in New York with um, this really cool movement uh, about the New York Public Water Project. And they're looking at the water issues of New York over geographic time and then over a political background and bringing it really into the watershed of today. And, and I was talking to them, I was like trying to put it into a context of, the, of New York. And I was like, okay, there's, um, there's 326 quadrillion gallons of water on the, on the globe. That's, that's 326 followed by 18 zeros, right? Sorry, quintillion, not quadrillion, quintillion gallons, 18 zeros. But if you were to make a sphere of that, that would be a sphere that was 860 miles in diameter, which is like the distance from New York to, to St. Louis. And I'm sorry to make this conversation too US wow. based, but, but it was about a New York project. So it's only all the water in the earth is only, a, it would be a sphere in the diameter from, from uh, uh, New York to St. Louis. But, but almost none of that water is, is, is directly usable by us. And you know, I'll let your listeners yell out why, if you're in the car, maybe scare everyone and just say, you know, it's salty, right? Yeah. And so, um, so there's only two and a half percent of that, that, that isn't salty. And that gives you 8.15 quintillion. So that's 8.15 followed by 18 zeros. That's a sphere from Staten Island to Boston. All of the, all of the like non-salty water, but then most of that isn't available. <laughs> And right, that only one percent of that is easily available, and people can yell out why, like frozen, right? Like now, now if you have kids in the car, they're singing frozen. But you've yelled out frozen. Yeah. That and that's <laughs> uh, that means that there's ninety one point five quadrillion gallons. That's ninety one followed by only twelve zeros. That's a sphere, fifty four miles in diameter. That's a sphere that's from like Bayshore, Long Island to the Bronx. That's all of the easily available yeah. water in the world. And I think once you recognize that, it becomes much more apparent that we should not be just wasting our water. Uh, that might have been the longest possible way I could answer why, <laughs> why I started <laughs> with, I got really excited, too many numbers, sorry. Um, I, <laughs> it's great, it gives us perspective. It really, it blows my mind. Like I do, I've done that math a few times now. I'm like, is this for real? You know, is that it? Um, <laughs> when I was teaching at the Watershed Resource Center, when I used to teach classes there to kids, and we had like a giant tube that was like maybe 12 feet high or 10 feet high, and then we had like a medium-sized tube, and then we had a test tube for the available water. Oh, so I could totally relate to what you're yeah. saying, yeah. And the kids were just, and the teachers. I would say the teachers were more surprised than the students. No, it's, it, it, it's mind-blowing. And then when you think about how much we just take water for, for granted, right? I, I, um, uh, I, you know, this might get gross, but like a lot of times when, when uh, I'm on the toilet, I'm thinking, wow, I'm about to defecate into the cleanest water <laughs> that, I, that I may ever see in the future. Like there's a really good chance that that mm -hmm. that there and I hope not. I hope we build a future that's better than this. But there's a really good chance mm -hmm. that in our future we would do anything for just a fraction of the gallons of water that we have pooped into. But you know, before 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 we pooped into them, <laughs> it does seem like we should be smarter than that. You know, like that that us of of all the animals should be like, hmm, maybe we should come up with a different system. Uh, and so there's a lot of different ways to do that. I focused on rainwater for, for a lot of reasons, for all the reasons we just said, but also because it really empowers a community in, in so many ways when they start catching their own resources. And rainwater is, is a pretty easy one to do. In the book, I cover how to do it with all different types of materials, you know, from, from traditional K-style gutters to PVC to bamboo. You know, from asphalt shingles to metal corrugated roofs, um, you know, just uh, 55 gallon drums, ferro cement tanks, plastic tanks, just the different things you can put together to start supplementing. And sometimes I'm doing this, I, I get to do these projects all around the world. Um, I feel very lucky. And I wrote the book because I can only do one every, you know, every month or two. Right. And I really wanted a lot more. And I was like, all right, let's 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 see if this works. Um, and it, and it has like, now I've had 
Uganda, Haiti, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Mexico, India, California, New York, of, of people sending me projects that they've made based upon the book. That's, that's a great feeling, I bet. Oh my God, it feels so amazing. I have like best possible outcome. And uh, um, no, even though that first book was so painful for me to write, it's inspired me to write the next, uh, which is To Catch the Sun, which I'm writing with a co-author, Dr. Joshua Pierce. We should have a Kickstarter out in about a month and a half uh, to make that book a reality. Um, we're almost done with the writing. Listeners should know that this book, the digital version of it is free. Yeah. And if you have money and you can pay to support um, Lonnie's work, you can also find it on Amazon, I believe, mm -hmm. and um, online. And, and your bookstores. Your, your local bookstore can, mm -hmm. uh, if they don't have it, they can order it in for you. And especially during this time, I really suggest trying to get it from your, from your local bookstore if you can. Yes. And I think you're going to translate it into many more languages once you have funding. That, for it, that right? is the hope. And hopefully with a, with, with a lot more funding than we had for the Spanish edition, which was, which was really difficult. But I'm really glad we have it out there. And, and also, if you, do buy, if you buy the book from the local bookstore, the proceeds of those sales, uh, whether you buy it from Amazon or a local bookstore, they go back to the Apropedia Foundation. So the, the money that you're, uh, that you're buying that book with buys the book and the proceeds are supporting future projects, it, including if you're looking for up to date, you know, we have, uh, there's always new rainwater projects being added to Apropedia, uh, as well as other, we have about, I think we have about 100 edits a day. Wow, that is amazing. What an active website. And it sounds like people are really um, updating things constantly. Um, we have a new, uh, uh, while we're mentioning Apropedia, I'd love to talk about our new executive director, um, Emilio. He is in El Salvador, and he has just done a fantastic job of, of really helping us figure out what people want next. Um, I think the worst part of our site, and if, you're, if your listeners are on there right now, they're listening to this, so I'm like, I'm going to check out the site right now at Apropedia.org. Um, one of the first things they might notice is that while we have this this avalanche of, of, of deep knowledge, it's kind of ugly and hard to navigate. Mm -hmm. And so we're really trying to come up with tools that make it easier to find the solution you're looking for, even if you don't know what it's called. Even if, you know, you just know that you're trying to, you're trying to, you have water issues um, and you're in this country and you have this re these resources, you want to know what you can do. We're trying to make it easier to find that. Interesting. And so if anyone has skills in that. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Reach yeah, out. Yeah. You can directly, wow, you can contact I... Emilio Velas directly or just uh, info at apropedia.org for sure. I can see how Apropedia, it's almost full circle. So the book um, is reaching out to people all around the world. Apropedia is this site online. It's an online presence of all these solutions. And then you're actually going in person to places around the world and with your team, not just you, right. um, and <laughs> collaborating with other people on solutions. So this is really exciting. I can see how it's full circle. Thank you. I feel really, yeah. really lucky to get to be in that circle. <laughs> Oh, it's so great, Lenny. So is there anything that we didn't chat about today that you would want to share with listeners? I mean, I think that there's a ton. Maybe you can have me on again in some amount of time. Um, I really enjoyed uh, uh, talking with you and the, the questions you had that made me think more deeply about some of my positions. I think your projects could be an episode for each one. Oh, yeah. And so you've mentioned Apropedia website, but I'm curious where listeners can find out more about your projects online. Uh, I'm on uh, Facebook and Instagram often, Twitter fairly often, LinkedIn, um, all of it under Lonnie Grafman, or sometimes just Lonnie G. And Apropedia, right? Apropedia.org has the page, I think. Oh, yeah. I have a user user page on there, Apropedia.org slash, slash Lonnie. Um, is, definitely have projects there. Yeah, I'm, I'm always interested in hearing about what people are doing, what they're accomplishing in their community. I love just being kind of getting to be constantly inspired by, by what people are doing. If there's, especially for the Rainwater book and the Solar book, if there's communities that, that are really looking for donations of the physical book, feel free to reach out to me uh, directly. I, I sometimes can pull that off. Uh, we got 20 books to to Puerto Rico somewhat recently. We got 100 books to uh, um, some schools in California last year. 
Uh, so feel free to reach out for me that is as well. That's exciting. And is would the best way be through social media? Which it say? usually is, but I'm also uh, yeah, that's that's the best way. <laughs> so, so. so Lonnie, this has been so wonderful to speak with you today. And I just had one last question, um, and it could even be a yes or no answer. But I'm wondering if you foresee a future where we are living in harmony with the natural world and where humans, not just the one percent, but all people and nature thrive, do you think that's possible? Yes. And <laughs> um, I think that it will look different in different communities and for different people. And I think that there is always going to be things that we're striving towards, right? There's always going to be new ways for us to strive for greater and greater um, equality and harmony. I'm just looking forward to a future where there's, those are nuances and not life or death. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you so much for joining um, us today. Thank you. I really appreciate your time, Jill, and I look forward to getting to meet some of your listeners. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. You can find us online at sustainableworldradio.com and also on iTunes. For more information about permaculture and ecology, visit the Sustainable World Media YouTube channel, where you'll find videos about permaculture, aquaponics, organic gardening, rainwater harvesting, and much, much more. Sustainable World Radio is a listener-supported program. If you like what we do, please consider making a donation to the show. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier, and thank you so much for listening. Mm -hmm.